Hi everyone, well done on making it through the late storms this evening. Um, lovely to have you here for this first question time of the year here at the Wheeler Centre. For those of you who haven't been before, this is a series that we've been running for a couple of years now. And it's essentially uh, an opportunity for the Wheeler Centre to get some people who are really expert in their fields or who have lots of ex lived experience of, of certain subjects up here on a stage and to give you open slather to ask them whatever you want in the space of one hour. So um, we've got some more really great subjects coming up this year. Uh, drug policy and harm reduction, the modern family, homelessness, radicalisation, just a few of them. So keep an eye on the Wheeler Centre website uh, to check out what's coming up later in the year. And we're starting off with a cracker tonight, technology and the brain, um, which I'm sure is something that all of us have thought about, worried about, hoped about in the last couple of years, just what are these things that we wear, the things that you've got in your handbags, what exactly are they doing to our brains, to our empathy, um, to our sense of self, to our memory, which is one that I think about a lot, to about, about, about our cognition. Um, and for the purposes of tonight, I think that we're going to, to talk about technology, both in terms of the hardware, but also the software, so the algorithms, the social media, because I think that we tend to lump it all in together and that's fair enough. Um, now, of course, throughout history, we've always worried about the effect that technology is having on our brain and on our social structures and on what it means to be human. You know, we were worried about, Plato, Plato writes about um, uh, being worried about the evolution of, of writing and writing as being a tool which came down to the matters. And of course, we worried about the printing press and the typewriter. But never before have we seen such a huge amount of exponential change and development in what should be tools for humans or what were always thought of as being tools of humans. And um, do we really actually understand how that is? changing us as human beings, how that is changing us as, as sentient creatures and what our head uh, does. So we've got two really great experts here this evening to talk to you about that from different um, fields as well, which is, which is very useful. So Olivia Carter is an Associate Professor and ARC Future Fellow at University of Melbourne School of Psychological Science, Sciences. <laughs> and Michael Arnold, that's a very big one, Michael Arnold's got just as big a one. He's an Associate Professor and Head of Department in the History and Philosophy of Science Program. Um, uh, my name is Madeline Morris. I host the Question Time series here at the Wheeler Centre in my day job. I am a reporter for 7.30. I'm currently on maternity leave. So this is the most people I've seen gathered in one space for quite some time. Um, and I want to give a, a bit of a, a, a welcome to a high school group we've got here from Upway High School. Can you guys put up your hands? You in? Great to see some school students here and making the um, journey in. So thank you very much. We hope that you come back to more of the question times uh, later on this year. So I think the best thing probably um, to do is just to have you both introduce yourselves and your fields of study and, and how where you're actually approaching this question of technology in the brain, Olivia? Sure. Um, so I have a pretty broad interest, but I guess fundamentally I'm interested in how my brain creates me and everything, in, you know, my perceptions, my experiences. I'm particularly interested in, in the neurotransmitters and how the natural chemicals in the brain impact the way we experience the world. But on a separate side, I'm quite interested in how new developments in, in neuroscientific knowledge or, or technologies that change the brain, how that also impacts society and so the sort of neuroethical sides of that. Mm. But, mm. And so you're coming from quite a hardware point of view, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested very much in, well, is it really, you know, we talk about things changing the brain, is it actually changing the brain or is it just our experiences? So, I'm a, yeah, I'm very much interested in what's happening inside and how the things inside your head impact who we are as mm. people. And Mike? Whereas I'm interested in the outside. I, <laughs> I don't know anything about what goes on my, on the inside. My, my uh, writing and research and teaching is concerned with technology in all sorts of daily life contexts. So I've um, done, done work on technology in education, uh, social media, social media use in, in the Asia Pacific and, and in Australia, uh, technology in general practice and in, in, and in medicine. 
uh, and most recently um, technology in death and dying, um, technology in the commemoration of the dead and new technologies in the disposal of bodies. So my, my interest in the brain Which, which is, if anyone is, has a question about that, feel free to ask, but probably not, get, not what we were thinking about you, tonight. It, it'll get us right off track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, the brain, of course, is, um, in some views anyway, is very important. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. can we, we'll launch Yeah, right sure. So yeah. What, what we'll do is um, uh, get your questions ready and we've got two ushers on either side to so put your hand up. I can't see you very well from up here, so you're better off trying to wave madly at them and they'll, they'll come and pick you and they'll do as many from the front as from the back. Um, and do get your questions in early is my tip because we always have too many at the end. Mike, what are you going to say? Yeah. Um, but that's a, of course, that's a Cartesian view of what it is to be a human. Others, others would argue that the body is, um, you know, the body is what we are, um, and efforts uh, we're making. We've made all sorts of efforts over over many years to outsource brain function to technologies um, through artificial intelligence and so, through through lots of uh, lots so of. So I have other to. My, my argument against that would be say I'd be happy to lose legs <laughs> over my head. Yeah. I'm happily, but, happy to outsource um, my legs, and, but I'd be less keen to give and, up the, the and, brain. And, of course, we do outsource. Every time we drive a motor car, yeah. we're outsourcing our legs to the motor car, to the tram, uh, to the aeroplane and so forth. Um, and we seem, we're happy to do that, it seems to me, because we do, n we do not value mm. um, the body and body functions as much as we value brain functions. But having said that, we're all, there's also desperate efforts to outsource, or outsource brain functions um, to technologies. And, and what you sent through when we were discussing this online, of course, a little bit um, earlier during the week, uh, you sent me through some reading which actually sort of questions the very notion of the fact that humans create technology and we are masters of that technology and it doesn't influence us. Tell us about that. Y yes, th th there's a view that... Um, Human, human beings are in charge. It's a, it, it's a very humanist, very human-centred view. Uh, and what it suggests is that um, we, we're pretty weak in our naked sense. Uh, we're not very capable and are very competent as naked apes. But through devising tools and devising technologies, we are able to act in the world in powerful ways. Now, that, that is true. Through developing these technologies, we are able to do all, all sorts of stuff, quite obviously. Um, maybe can I, I'll tell a story that people might have, uh, many of you would have seen um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. You, you might recall that very moving and powerful scene where, uh, near the start of the movie, where a pre human picks up an animal thigh bone and plays with the thigh bone, as you would, and then either by happenstance... As you, as you would. As you would. <laughs> and then either by happenstance or by accident, smacks the thigh bone on the skull of a dead animal sitting nearby and the skull cracks open. A eureka moment. A very important moment in human history where an object is taken from nature and is transformed into a technology a technology which is a powerful technology. But that transformation of thigh bone into club is not, in my view, the most important transformation. The most important transformation is, the way, is not the way the pre-human transforms the thigh bone, but the way the thigh bone transforms the pre-human into a killer. And that is the case with all kinds of technologies, um, it, it seems to me, including technologies that don't simply transform our limbs, mm. so uh, but technologies that transform the functioning of, of the mind and brain. Another good example of that um, from a piece that I read was about the clock, 
when the clock first came into common usage in around about, I think it was the 14th century or so, we went away from using our senses to tell us when it was time to eat, when it was time to sleep, um, it, when it was time to work. We were suddenly dictated by this external machine. And we now have, of course, all adapted to that. Um, yeah. So did you have a, 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 a point on mics there and then we'll yeah. take some questions? Well, I, I, it's, it, I'm a little bit maybe fatalist, I know it's the, the right word, but, but this f feeling that we just are, we go through our world and our brains learn what is around them and by definition our environments impact who we become, you know, trauma or whatever. The brain's always changing. It's always changing, but there's a, there's a real difference often in, the, in the, these types of discussions about, oh, you know, I, I, was, I was once, many, many years ago when the project, the seven, you know, the Channel 10 or whatever, show the project, I was interviewed, oh, what, what's happening if we've got all this digital stuff, apparently gigabytes of information our brains are being exposed to, we, we get, are our brains going to be explode or something like this, I was asked. It's like, we just forget, you know, it's, we don't yeah. explode, we just don't remember when mm -hmm. it's too much information. So, you know, this, this, this feeling... Because, and we've outsourced our memory yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah, but that's, yeah. That, that's the thing. But the yeah. actual, if you were to say, how many units of information do we remember now versus how many units of information did we remember when we were, you know, wandering around the savannas in Africa? Well, we would understand very different information, but it's utterly not clear from the science whether, it's, whether we're retaining less now. It's different, but... This idea, that there seems to be this feeling is because we're outsourcing this stuff, we know different information that we couldn't have learnt before if we spent all of our childhood learning how to build fires out of sticks mm -hmm. and navigating by the stars. That would be bloody hard, or I shouldn't say. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, it's, so, so I would say our, what we're learning is very different, but are we becoming dumber somehow, or is our capacity to absorb new information different? Mm -hmm. But we are becoming more forgetful as more information comes to us. Well, you might remember the latest tweet from Donald Trump and forget your child's phone number. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or forget your child. You as, forget as, your child. As, yeah. But yeah. that is different to saying you're actually becoming more forgetful. You're remembering different information, mm -hmm. and possibly because we're exposed to more things, we're encoding things with less detail, mm. but I don't think the evidence out there that we're dumber. Okay. Um, that, but that, the, capacity, <laughs> the capacity to outsource memory is so much greater. You, you mentioned before Plato being worried about uh, writing mm. and, uh, in, in conditions w w w in a written culture as opposed to an oral culture, memory wouldn't be as important, and, and I think that's true. Um, and we've moved now f uh, past writing to all sorts of digital devices that do our uh, so much of cognitive grunt work um, for us. Mm. Um, you know, m m math students who can't calculate, um, English mm. students who can't spell, uh, n none of us who can remember our family's phone, <laughs> our family's <laughs> phone numbers. You, you know, all, all of that is outsourced. Now, does this mean we are dumber? I don't, I don't know. It's really hard because, uh, because we can't separate us from the thigh bone. You know. W we are technologically we are enabled. We are, we are cyborgs. Mm. We, we are already we cyborgs. Already we have, have been for, you know, a long, long time. So, all right. Let's take some questions. What have we got? I guess I'll kick it off. Uh, my name's Alex. I initially had one question, but subsequently through the conversation, it sort of evolved. Uh, you mentioned with the thigh bone and uh, basically taking that and hitting a, a skull over the head, and uh, and the changes, I guess, in the human mindset. Uh, with, let's say, robotics initially, we were able to start outsourcing physical tasks. Now with Just the, lift the mic up a wee bit, sorry, Alex, if you can. Uh, okay. With the outsourcing of physical tasks in manufacturing and such. Now that we're really progressing to artificial intelligence, and I guess the initial step would be the likes of IBM's Watson program, do you think we'll get to a point where some of the more research and uh, psychological tasks will be undertaken by computers? And at that point, what place does that really have for humans in the world? That's the big question, isn't it, facing all of us? Can I, can I, before you lose the microphone, can I ask what, what do you mean by other psychological tasks will be outsourced by computers? Like, well, with the uh, with the IBM sort of technology mean? Watson, it's basically you're putting in a lot of a lot of data, a lot of information, and it's able to start to draw correlations that would take 
the human mind many, many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to draw that sort of, sort of correlations. Uh, they're looking at doing that sort of thing with legal documentation. So rather than having a series of lawyers look through various reports and say, hey, look, there's a precedent for this, 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 they'll be able to use these early forms of artificial intelligence mm. to draw those calculations before humans even need it. Okay, so, so I'd, I have a response to that. If that's, yeah. um, so, so, I, I, you've, so I'm gl glad I asked the question because I think you've, those two examples you gave really highlight the point is that, that these computers are doing things that would take a human being possibly lifetimes to find patterns in things. And that, so, so these sorts of algorithms are ident identifying new, new information, okay? But they're not, in general at the moment, they're not that good at doing the sorts of things that humans are, are good at. Like, at the moment, there isn't a person that's employed in a, in a law firm that's spending a lifetime going through legal documents, finding small patterns and correlations. And, and similarly, I think in medicine, it's, it's huge at the moment, you know, to find n novel correlations because we're what we've, our brains are very good at finding averages, okay, but not these little anomalies and these weird patterns that you might find that if you have this particular gene and that blood type and eat this diet, well, you're going to have 10% more chance of getting a heart attack. There's probably no human doctor around that could make those connections just through their personal practice. Now, that doesn't mean what they're currently providing as a, as a doctor is, is going to be less valued. So uh, to me, it's a really, I, I'm not at all concerned that the sorts of things people are good at. I mean, things like education, we're very good at communicating with each other. The, the types of apps that are coming out are generally being found not to be particularly helpful to teaching a six year, you know, a 12-year-old how to do maths, you know. So, so I, I th there are things that we're, we're gaining, but at the moment it's not a, at all clear to me that those things are taking away current skill sets from humans. So, yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of a question, slightly different question from what is actually happening to the brain, isn't it? Sort of how, what the usurpment of the brain in certain functions is going to actually do to us as humans, mm. but it's very related yeah. to the brain because and it's our brain function that's what being we used. What we use the, our brain for as opposed to outsourcing. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the first cab off the rink would be programmatic tasks. Um, a, mm. you know, as Turing described um, a long time ago in his thesis, a, anything that can be precisely defined mm. can, be, can be performed by a computer. And we, we've, uh, we often think uh, that um, some forms of white collar work, you know, they're, they're intellectual mm. tasks and won't be touched. But I, I would have thought things like accounting and bookkeeping, you know, they are programmatic, and I, I can't see a future for, the, for, but, you know, but for, this for is, that kind of work. I mean, this, this is a slightly more philosophical question, but so much of who we are as human beings, our sense of worth derives from our sense, our work and what we do to be productive. Um, and psychologists will tell you that till the cows mm -hmm. come home. Mm -hmm. So if we now have less work or less, does that mean that we're going to find more work? Um, no. Does that mean that we're going to do different things? Or yeah. are we just going to have less we'll, of a sense we'll, of ourselves? We, we will watch more cute cat videos. I think that's, does the, is I that think going that's, to give us a I good sense pretty, of, I think of worth, pretty, though? I think that's pretty clear. I, 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 discuss, I discuss this with my with my students quite quite a bit. There's a there's a guy named um, Borgman who, who writes about um, the way technologies disburden us, um, and he, he gives the he uses the analogy of a wood burning stove, where um, when when one uses the wood burning stove, one needs to um, do a lot of work. You're, you're burdened. You've got to engage with chopping the wood. You've got to engage with carting the wood. You've got to engage with telling the difference between different kinds of wood. You've got to engage with kindling and, and then big logs. You've got to engage with whether you're going to put more, more wood on the fire or not put more wood on the fire and save it up for next day. If you're as old as me, you've got to engage with young people who are strong enough to carry the wood for you because you can't split it and, and so on and so forth. Alternatively, we can push a button and have heat. So, which, which kind? What, what is that technology doing doing to us? Uh, do we want to be dis 
do we want to be disburdened in the way pushing the button does it? And my students, they all say, yeah, yeah, of course, it's crazy having uh, wooden, you know, in, uh, wood burning stoves. Sure, we want to push the button. In order to do what, I say? Yeah. Oh, well, we write poetry, <laughs> play, play music. I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think so. That is, that is just is not what people do mm. with the time they have on their hands having been disburdened by more and more technologies which mean that people are engaging less and less and doing less and less and making fewer and fewer decisions and ultimately living less and less. Because our life is the collective of our experiences, some of which are what the things that we actually do for ourselves which provide us with yeah. satisfaction. Yeah, well, con consider the way a um, driverless car disburdens us from, from, from driving. Um, we are disengaged from driving. Now, for, for a lot of people, that's fantastic because they don't like driving. Um, but for a lot of people too, driving is one of these mundane, everyday tasks that mm. is living. I it, suppose it, that it, cooking is, is something. I mean, there have been... There have been we can all buy a ready-made meal, can't we? But so many of us continue to cook because for health reasons, but also because of the pleasure that it gives us. Exactly, yeah. Mm. And the, in, in the philosophy of technology... But I don't want to do long division for my, for my maths you'd problems, rather have a, You'd That's rather right. have a calculator do that, yeah. Mm. So can I... So I'm, I'm going to take exception to this. If you know, is, is the, Because I guess maybe I'm coming at from a, a different perspective. You talk about... Cooking and, you know, you've got all the cooking shows and probably people today presumably have nicer pots and pans than they did 100 years ago. They probably have heating on and they aren't running out the back door to chop wood. But I'm not sure that the, the, the person that's enjoying cooking a meal today is having less of a valid experience or somehow a, a less lived experience than the person a hundred years ago. I mean, the, we're talking about we get fulfilment from your job. It's true, but you know, in a different generation in a different country, we weren't doing the jobs we were doing now. And reality, if you take a step back, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like I normally view the word like this, but effectively, if you believe in evolution, our what we do is we're social organisms that find partners and build families, you know, and, and become experts in things, and we find fulfilment in those things. It's just, it's, I, what I find, I almost flip it the other way and think it's remarkable how people find meaning in, actually, if you, you know, if you think about it, it, it's hard to know where that's coming. So, for example, how many Twitter followers do I have? You know, I don't have a Twitter account, but people care about that stuff. They talk to their friends of every... So you, you don't so, have a Twitter account? No, is, that, is this problematic? So you don't, you haven't experienced the addiction that is Twitter. I have Twitter. a Twitter account and then I got bombarded after the three days of just getting these BBC alerts of, of something happened in, you know, Africa. And I was mm -hmm. like... Oh, this so is... your brain felt overburdened? No, just, I just felt like this was not a good use of my time. Right, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's good that you were actually able to make that decision, though, but that, that there are people who can't make that decision because they do genuinely get properly addicted to those things. And yeah. I would actually put myself into that yeah. category, you know. I feel like the amount of time... And who, who hasn't sat there at, like, 10.30 at night on Facebook going, I've really got to go to bed because I've really got to get up tomorrow morning, but um, I'll just go and see what that person did. Who, who's done that? Mm, yeah. Oh, you are all lying if you are saying that you are not doing that, and and that that kind of brings me to that to that yeah, yeah. addiction thing, which is one of the big things which yeah. we, which we talk about in terms of technology. Yeah. So that's that is one thing that I I, I do think is different. Um, so not so much the the content, as I said, we our brains we learn the things that we're exposed to, but but I I do think the way that the brain learns. Uh, from its environment is, I guess it puts more emphasis on, on reliable information, I guess. Is if, you, if you do X and you get a reward straight away every time, well, you may as well do that thing again as opposed to some other thing that has a, a lower likelihood or lower expectation that you'll get the expected outcome. I mean, in really sort of simple terms, often when you drill down, the brand uses these sorts of simple 
Okay, if on average that was a positive experience, let's do that again, more than the thing that on average was less positive. And I do think one thing that's changing with the, the digital media and the, the, the sort of iPads, that, that ability to control the outcome, this is actually gets into the sorts of things I know you're interested in, is that you, you unlike, I argue with my children that, look, I don't mind if you spend half an hour watching cartoons on the TV, but to me it's really quite different the way they engage when three minutes after their cartoons change, they can push another button and instantly get exactly the episode. You know, my two-year-old demands the particular episode of Thomas the Tank Engine he wants to watch. Mm. It has to have, you know, this train in it, and if I push that button, I'll get it. And just even watching them, I mean, there's neuroscience behind this, but, but the extraction of that, the, the reward loop that goes round and round, you, get the, you hit the dopamine, you get the reward, this is good, this is good, to pull that away is a different sort of engagement. It, regardless of the content, that capacity to have, yeah. just to turn it on with instant gratification with 100% success rate. And it's that instant gratification, isn't it, which is the yeah, it's, which then becomes the issue because if we expect that in other areas yeah. of our life as well... Well, and also the we instant gratification it. is exactly how the brain learns. If things can happen with a certain probability, you know, like a, a pokey machine or whatever, but also there's probability in time. So if it's always an immediate... That's the strongest signal for your brain. So what yeah. is happening to your two-year-old's brain and how do you... And my five-year-old's brain, because she will do exactly yeah. the same thing. What is happening to her brain and how is that going to affect her brain in 15 years' time? So, so I don't think it's having a, necessarily going to change the brain in 15 years' time, but I do think the capacity to extract yourself from this highly rewarding situation, hmm. it turns an otherwise sort of passive experience, still enjoyable... You might very much enjoy a show, like if you turned up to a theatre, you might enjoy the show, but no part of you is thinking, well, I'll, I'm going to re replay that, mm. you know, the actors can all come back. That's not part of the experience. So I think it's just, it makes it harder to extract yourself. And I don't think, I honestly don't think 15 years later that's going to have a huge impact. But this, this capacity to just break away and you get sucked in and you sort of have to or is mildly addicted to all these things around you makes things harder. Mm -hmm. People like Mark Zuckerberg and his team are, uh, are very good at what they do. Mm. They're very good at attracting eyeballs and holding eyeballs. They're probably not as good as poker machine yeah. manufacturer <laughs> who for 20 or 30 years have employed um, mm. the best psychologists in the world mm. to make their machines addictive. Mm. And they've certainly succeeded in that. Um, Facebook don't do a bad job either. YouTube, as you were, mm -hmm. as you were suggesting, YouTube do a good job mm. a, a, as well. And then there are the ethics of that, which we could go into and sort of the ethics of, of technologists and whether they actually think about the ethics of the, the things that they're creating. You know, if you write, if you want to, if you work in the medical field and you want to design a three-parent baby, as we've seen in the last year or so, for, for want of a better term, um, you have to go through a rigorous ethics procedure for that, mm. yet none of the technology which could be impacting our lives in, in a very profound mm. way has to actually go through any of that kind of rigorous testing. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've, written, I've written papers about the fact that not only you talk about just media, Facebook and, and the like, you can buy brain stimulators that send electrical current through your scalp and they have gone through no safety testing beyond what you would put a toaster through. Okay, they have to prove that it won't sort of self-combust as a as a technological device, but they don't have to prove in any way that the current that it's sending is what it says it's sending, or that that would be a positive thing for your brain. So that's a, that's the more issue. I mean, I'm quite interested in that side of things, but why would anyone want a brain stimulator? <laughs> well, there's all sorts of people out there saying that it helps them concentrate. The Computer games. There, there I mean, I personally computer think computer gamers, really. There are computer doing, games yeah. that, um, where, where, where the device is controlled by This is a bit of a brain, rabbit hole, but this is thoughts, actually really yeah. fascinating. Yeah. You wear a, wear a skull cap yeah. and you think and you can control devices by thinking. Yeah. Oh, I, there is a whole world out yeah. there that I know nothing yeah. about. Who, yeah. who would like to ask another question? Yes, please. Comment first. So uh, uh, your children and pushing and replaying... Yeah programs that they like, 
doesn't seem to have affected the 30 and 40 something people. I remember my son with the Star Wars videos on VHS when they came out, played the same episodes over and over again until he could remember each word yep. that each of the characters said throughout the entire two, two and a half hour episode. Yep, yep. Um, which surprised me that he could be bothered doing that, but he did. <laughs> That, uh, by the way, led me to think a little bit about a question that I was going to ask before you started that business about the re doing things. I've heard that uh, reading uh, and uh, writing has changed the memory ability of humankind. Uh, once people would memorise long poems, sagas, much longer than one person's part in a play, um, is it true that once upon a time people could remember larger, longer bodies of work, and that reading and writing has changed not just a few individuals, but has changed mankind, humankind's ability to memorise large amounts of stuff by being able to read it rather than having to memorise it. And do we have anything to learn? If it is true that that ha did happen a thousand years ago, is there anything that we've got to learn from that now? Um, poetry was, uh, as I understand it, uh, poetry was devised in part as a, as a memory aid. Um, the rhythms and, and, and the rhymes, um, and certainly in a pre-literate culture, um, the capacity to memorise very large uh, slabs of text was very highly valued. Still is today. Um, in uh, Muslim communities, the ability to memorise the Quran and be, to be able to accurately recall the Quran is valued, and, and people do manage to do it. But there is, as I understand it, there is also evidence that we are doing that concentration spans uh, are not uh, as, as they were. Um, so, for example, in reading, um, there's, uh, I think that you know, physiological work that shine infrared lights into people's eyes in order to see where, where their eyes are moving um, across the screen, see that it's not a linear start at the top, go across, go across, go across, and you know, read sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, page by page. There's a snatch on the screen. There is a snatch and grab eye movement, uh, and of course, Mark Zuckerberg and many others who design websites know about this, and they use different um, sized fonts and, and bold fonts uh, on keywords and key phrases, and people move quickly and snatch and grab. Uh, again, anecdotal evidence from my students: When was the last time you sat with a book and read for an hour? without the hyper-stimulation of colour, movement, sound, multiple screens, you know, being open at the same time. Can, can I ask that of the audience? Who um, has read, let's say, half an hour? Let's make it easy. Who's, who's, who's read a book for half an hour in the last month? I have. Yeah. You? Have you both done that? Oh, well, yeah. I've, I've read things for half an hour, but I've no, not, but not, not a lot of fiction book. at the moment. Yeah. So is that because we're all older and <laughs> will, will our daughters, our children be able to do that? It's really difficult to separate out um, th those variables. Mm -hmm. you, you, there, there are differences in the way people perform and, and behave according to their screen use. Yeah. So people who multitask routinely, for example, perform differently to mm. people who do not multitask. But the chicken and egg is really difficult there to sort out, whether it's something about their, their personality or co cognition mm. or whatever that predates multitasking mm. and leads to the proclivity to multitask, which leads to a decline in performance, mm. or whether it's the multi-screen multitasking that leads to changes in, mm. in um, performance yeah. is difficult to sort out. And then, then you've got you know, correlations that are made between um, screen time um, and, and performance, uh, how do you factor in their different parenting styles where it may well be that uh, kids who've grown up with lesser screen time 
have less of screen time because yeah. the, the, the parents are parenting in a different way to those who are having more yeah. screen time. So is it the screen time or is it the parenting? Yeah. That there's these kinds of things that are really difficult yeah. to sort out. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that. Certainly in the... the I, I don't think there's a lot of strong evidence one way or the other in terms of what is the clear impact of these different, um, I guess parenting styles and all the rest of it. But if, again, if you, th if, you, if you go back and you just think, right, well, effectively, we're all, our brains are born, and this nutrition's changing, but, you know, an infant comes into the world fairly much with a similar sort of brain as it, it did generations ago. And it's learning from its environment. So if... I, I do think you learn skills in, for example, imaginary play, OK? If you're learning those skills, if you don't... If you're bored and you've got your next-door neighbour and your little brother to play with and nothing else, well, you start playing games. And you remember last time we had some funny game hiding in the bush, that was fun, let's do that again, you know. So as a, that's what we do and we become expert in those things. So I, I would completely disagree, but there's no science, no one's done this study, that we've lost the capacity, like the 20-year-old, the, the generation of 20-year-olds or... or whoever, whichever generation has lost the ability to learn long texts. I mean, you look at, I was thinking, the, you know, Buddhist monks, it's in some values, in some cultures, that's highly valued still in some positions, and I, I would dispute that a, a monk today has a noticeably harder time than a monk a generation before. Now, whether but, but, a kid in, in our society that's, that's growing up, and even things like, as a, as a student, we've got some students here, you normally, if you're sitting exams, they normally make a point that teachers you, you have practice exams. And that's partly because you learn to sit there and there's a certain way of engaging. And I do think that there are those sorts of skill sets that can be developed in the capacity to just sit. I mean, we do, I do a lot of very boring um, tasks that are sort of testing vision. My husband will attest to this. You sit there in front of a computer screen, pushing, did it go beep? Did you see a light? Push a button if you did. And that for an hour and a half, people are doing these things. It's really boring. And we get very different uh, results from just the average person off the street versus the third year undergraduate student. Because the third year undergraduate student is used to just saying, right, well, I have for course credit, I have to sit here for an hour and push this button. And they're kind of practiced at just sitting still and remember, you know, doing some relatively boring tasks. So I do think that there is these higher level skills that we can generate, you know, but that I don't think it's the case that we're losing these fundamental capacities of human processing. The comment, I mean, but I... Not, but not sorry. on a physiological no. sense, but certainly yeah. in a learnt ability sense. Well, it depends. It's sort of the comment before it can be taken either way. Is our ability to remember text changing? Is the ability to remember the no, ability to remember? But the motivation has changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The motivation has changed, and, and the daily, you know, performance in daily mm -hmm. life has, has changed. So the human brain is fundamentally the same. Yeah, but if as we, it was. But if tomorrow, I guess 10, the question is, if tomorrow ago. you changed your motivations, if tomorrow you decided you want to sit down and read a book for an hour, I would suggest you'd probably be able to do that. So we'll take a, the next question in, in, a, in uh, just a moment, but we've heard a lot about sort of wearable tech and one of the things was Google Glass, which I don't actually, actually exist anymore. I think it was a bit of a failure. But um, I, I read this quote from Sergey Brin of, of Google and he said, certainly, he said that ten, this 10 years ago, certainly if you had all the world's information directly attached to your brain or an artificial brain that was smarter than your brain, you'd be better off. Now, there are lots of things to dissect in that statement, but one of them is if you had something attached to your brain, which had all of the world's information, could your brain handle that? What would your brain do with that? Would it forget, as you said it would? I mean, do we ha does our brain have extra capacity to be able to hold that? You know, what from a, on a fundamentally sort of physiological level, can you answer that question? Well, I would say... I mean, I don't really understand exactly... If they're effectively saying... He's saying you could outsource everything, we'd be very bored. I think we'd quite quickly... What we'd find is some bizarre... We're very driven organisms to, to competitive, 
So we'd find some ridiculous... Is that hardwired in us? I think it is. Right. You know, I mean, other people would disagree, but the, you, we'd find some ridiculous way to be better than the other person that was also had this. We'd probably go out and spend all our energy trying to find points like the Pokemon thing. We'd create some virtual thing to get more information into this artificial thing attached to our head. I don't know. I mean, this is now... I, I, it's quite a ridiculous sort of... Mm. Um, it, it's come up in a policy um, sense. It, it, like, it, at the moment, mm. it, it, it doesn't exist at, uh, as in plug it in the back behind mm. your ear, mm. um, but it does <laughs> exist in terms of being able to access the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the policy sense in which it's come up is with um, teaching science um, in schools. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about that balance between kids knowing stuff mm. and kids being able to find out stuff? Mm. And... It, back when I was a school teacher um, 20 years ago, uh, the, 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 the view there, the, the view then was very much um, that we were in the business of teaching kids to find out stuff, mm. not to know stuff. Now, mm. the pendulum has swung the other way, it seems to me, mm. and certainly science educators are saying it's very important that kids know stuff. Mm. Not not just be able to find Find it out. out. So the the outsourcing to to the internet, it's not enough to be able to use Google uh, and to be able to use Wikipedia to find out. So I suppose my my question following on from that Sergey Brin quote is that, you know, I'm sure that I've read places and and you all would have read them as well that, you know, our brain only uses 10% of its capacity. Mm. And so if, if we have a, something either hardwired into here or we have stuff hardwired here, which we can, by some miracle, do an instant search the second our brain thinks of it and goes on and we find the answer written up on our glasses, uh, is the brain able to cope with that or thrive or how would the brain respond to that? Yes. Can I, can I change the question slightly? Because I'd actually not... I have not really heard people talking about that in a tangible way. Maybe how that just in a separate computer attaches straight into your head, not too sure. But what I have read, seri- you know, the, the serious discussion out there that I find hard to get my own head around is the idea... So there's two classes of, of people. This, this feeling that we're being outpaced by technology, mm. OK? So not in the case that you're talking about in terms of let's just we're all happily as we are, but how about we just attach this thing to us? There is, particularly there's this, this hub in Silicon Valley where there's a lot of you know, tech billionaires and, and there's also a lot of neuroscience going on there and there's a lot of people talking. And there, there are people, I've spoken to people that have been in meetings where the, the, um, like these, these billionaires are funding research into ways that they can basically they're funding their own private scientists. This is actually happening so that they can outpace the artificial world around them. So there's this Elon Musk who's you know of Tesla fame and now being was in all the media all the time. He's written some. He's genuinely seriously writing these papers about maybe we're all stuck in this simulated world. And he and other billionaires are paying computer programmers to try and hack themselves out of the simulation just in case they're in one. (laughs) It's exactly, this is, it's crazy. And there's other people, so I don't know the name of this particular person, but I know for a fact there's someone that's hired a full-time neuroscientist and put in millions of dollars into trying to, so with Parkinson's disease and these types of things, they are, you know, stimulating brain regions to increase dopamine release and that's all fine. But there's also efforts to stimulate directly into the parts of the brain that code memories. So there the point is, well, if we could remember more, not to outsource, not to just have a box Mm. where it sits there, what about if we could just have a box that detects the world around us, because those boxes exist, we've got artificial systems that, that... And then to feed them directly in. So it becomes part of the real experience. Mm. You know, as opposed to just it sort of hops, and that that if we're forgetting, it doesn't matter because they'll just stimulate the remember the memory bit. Now, the the where we are in terms of understanding brain function, and and that is so far away. But but that people are talking in those areas, I find mind-boggling. This idea that we're going to be overtaken by 
technology. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a, a, a sort of conclusion to that, but people are, are taking those things seriously and money is being invested in, in these ways. Mm, which sounds terrifying to me. It's, it's, it sounds half terrifying, half insane to, to me. But. Mm, mm. Okay, <laughs> next question, please. Uh, two um, questions related. One is, are we losing our capacity to have um, intrinsic rewards? And the other one is with regard to autonomy. Um, I work in health services and we have to actually write everything down and that goes into algorithms or if it doesn't now will, um, which will determine how we function in our day-to-day -day work environment. And I should imagine that would become fairly widespread in other industries. So I just wonder about the intrinsic rewards and the autonomy. By intrinsic rewards, you mean feeling good about something that you've done yourself? That, that's that you... right. Having yeah. the capacity to spend time doing something um, in an autonomous way so you're not relying on those um, the soft extrinsic rewards mm -hmm. and you get on games and what have you mm -hmm. and the those hard extrinsic rewards? Mm. I guess um, what philosophers, what some philosophers of technology would say there is that we need to be prepared to make judgments about technology, not simply accept that high technology is good and low technology is not good and that it, version 2.1 is better than version 2, etc. So actually make a judgment about whether to deploy this technology in your life or in your workplace or not. And that in itself is, is a big step for a lot of people. So just to that but, um, intrinsic rewards question, I mean, is there evidence along those lines? Have there been studies done in, into that about whether people have lost the capacity to generate their own happiness if it, uh, from within or whether it needs to come from without? We know that people do get and you gave examples yourself of people who use focal practices or focal technologies as they're called for the intrinsic reward of doing things, of being engaged, of being burdened with things like playing the piano. Mm. I, I, can, I can buy a CD or I can download the best piano playing in the world, um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's no substitute mm. for playing the piano yourself. It's no, going out to a restaurant is all very fine, I like doing that, but it's no substitute for cooking. So the, the, this is, um, the, the position that's put is to say, uh, yes, let's have technological development, let's have innovation, let's continue this journey we've been on uh, for thousands of years, but let's, for goodness sake, make some judgments about what technologies enable us to live more what technologies are intrinsically rewarding, you know, such as a copper, uh, a copper saucepan. You know, <laughs> yes, we'll say yes to the copper saucepan, uh, and we'll say no to what used to be called a TV dinner. I don't know what they're called now, mm -hmm. but but you'll you'll know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I might I might jump to answering the the second question because um, I actually think I mean I haven't spent too much time thinking about it in, in, in detail, but. That issue of autonomy to me is also is actually really interesting. I mean, I don't I don't have particular. There are all sorts of concerns about privacy that is separate to that. But there is part in terms of the way we engage in the world. If we're just thinking from the very purely biological perspective and not the larger sociological sort of version of this, we it is it is known one of the the, the best ways or most reliable ways to induce stress in a person is this feeling of lack of control. So if, if the way we work, if so much of our lives is sort of plugged in to systems of things like email coming all the time or the, the, ability, or the inability to disengage, it's, it's not to say, in the past what we've been talking about here is to say, are we getting better and worse at disengaging? And, I, th I think to the extent that we can, con we are in control of the decisions, then they're just different decisions, you know. But when we lose control to disengage, when we actually can't get away from the boss knowing where we are and be contactable at, you know, three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, well, that itself actually puts you in a different sort of framework. And I, I do think that that's a different sort of conversation where 
that type of technology or it's a bit different, but if you can't control... People often talk about being bombarded by images of horrible scenes around the world news and all the rest of it. Now, it's already bad, but if you can't... If there's no way to extract yourself from that because there's just always TV on and everywhere you look, you're getting this. So, so I do think that that is starting to change with the way technology is getting to every part of our lives as we... There's an element where you lose control of that, and if you actually are losing control, that becomes quite a stressful sort mm -hmm. of situation. Mm -hmm. um, just a, I guess a question probably ties a little bit back to what to, um, Alex raised initially, where, you know, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation. Um, and with these technologies, a lot of it is to do with data and the quality of the import of data. And then, of course, there's the interpretation of that data that goes with it. Um, and, you know, recently there's been these wonderful headlines in the States how criminals should be fearful of this new algorithm that's going to get rid of all the crime in the world. But the reality is it's the quality of the data that goes into the system and then the interpretation of that data um, that is questionable. And, and, the, and I guess I would say the human experience is really what enables that interpretation as opposed to an algorithm that's been put in also by another human. Another interesting side conversation to have. Um, but I guess the, the question that I have for the panel today is in that sense of whether it's behaviourally or physiologically, when we're relying more um, on these sorts of technologies and the way that then potentially can manipulate our interpretation of the data, where potentially... Could that lead us in the future in terms of future generations and their understanding to look for the source as opposed to accept what they've been told or given with this? That's a very meta question. It, it's, sorry. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, and it comes back to that loop in terms of they're sitting on YouTube, they're watching it, they can play it over and over again. They're not living that experience. They're seeing it through somebody else's eyes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the question I have is in terms of the data that, that's that spits out of a, a particular system that says X, Y and Z, how, how do we develop in terms of interpreting that data? So, so one... I have I, a I quick question if we can, because I'll answer, because I'd like to get to, to one more question. Okay, so, so one thing it. I would just... I don't know if it exactly answers your, that question, because it was quite a complex question, but I do think that one, one of these tricks, I think it's worth sort of being aware of that the brain uses to, to survive in this complex world that we're in, um, in which a lot of the information that we're exposed to just washes over us. But there is absolutely the case that one trick across evolution is that if something is happening with greater frequency, it's sort of well, more believable, as it were, OK? So that's fine if you're trying to find, well, the, the red fruit. If you eat the berry when it's red, you're going to get a sore tummy because of the last four times you did that. That's true. And if, you know, so that sort of rules. Now, again, that, that's how our brain has evolved. So if when we're looking on the internet or searching on YouTube, in this world of the kind of um, post-truth sort of, you know, reality, whatever this is, is that if what we're be encountering in a way that our, our brains in a dumb system would consider semi-random is not remotely random, well, it, that, that, that we're not learning, we haven't been taught or evolve to be super sceptical of that, OK? If, if you click on five, ten different sources and they all say the same thing and they all happen to be tapping into the same Fox News network, well, that makes, this, that makes it more real in our brains. And I do think that's something we're, we're going to have to start teaching students to say, this, you're going to have to fight that because we've evolved in a world where we can trust if you've mm. encountered the thing ten times in a row, mm. it's probably true. Well, you can't trust that, and that's something we're going to have to to uh, to, to learn, be aware of. I that's think. That's very interesting. Okay, um, if you don't mind, Mike, I'll just take take another sure. question. Uh, hi, um, I'm Bonnie. I'm with the Up by High Kids, and um, you guys have touched on almost all of the areas of study we do at v in VCE philosophy. Uh, and so my mind is racking for which of the questions um, could I ask that would help these guys the most. Um, but are you philosophy students, are yes, you? Yes, yeah. Oh, great. Yep. 
Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm interested in maybe the ethical implications, and some of it, have come, some of it has come up, like um, whether technology makes us dumber or whether we could outsource moral decision-making to a robot, um, those kinds of ethical implications. Um, to what extent does um, technology impact on consciousness? Um, Pick one. <laughs> yeah, I know, I don't know which one. I, 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 so, I mean, w will technology make us happier, I guess, would sum up a fair, a fair chunk of what we study. Yeah. That's, a good, that's okay. a good place to end as well. We'll let the philosopher answer. Te technology will make us, make us happier if we choose technologies that enable us to live more. Do to we have evidence? To, in, to engage more. Do we have evidence that that's what we're doing currently? No, no. This is a philosophical point. It's not. <laughs> it's not a. It's it, it. Which brings me to the, the the second point here, which pertains exactly there to um, uh, to your suggestion. Your suggestion is that there is some sort of calculation that we can perform, which indicates whether we're going to be happier or not. Now, in a technological world, and this comes back also to the question asked before, in a, in a technological life. Calculation trumps judgment. Yeah, do, do we want to live like that? Sorry, I'm just thinking about that. I'm sort of cal calculating in my brain. I haven't come back to a satisfactory and, and answer. I guess I would say, to the extent that you control your technology, will technology make you happier? There's all sorts of things out there, whether it's some new cooking gadget, whatever, you know, that absolutely allows you to engage more with the world yeah, yeah. and there are other things that are just completely that send you back to the cat videos yeah yeah exactly yeah. so, so exactly. make the make uh, make the judgment and, on, uh, yeah. can I uh, on the ethical question I, I uh, that that perks my interest because I take a really hard line on this I think it's not just the Zuckerbergs etc who need to make ethical judgments about the technologies that they design and make available but um, I think that technologies in and of themselves can and should be held to moral account. Not just the people who make them or use them, mm -hmm. but the technologies themselves. Mm. We just don't have anyone to do that at this point in time, other than mum and dad sitting down with the kid deciding whether she's allowed yeah. to watch it, Thomas it, the Tank yeah, Engine for it's the done tenth on, time. In exceptional circumstances, phosphorus bombs, for example, uh, in, in and of themselves uh, regarded as, as um, un, uh, uh, unacceptable. Um, I, so battery, the, he, bat, battery cages for him. So, so, well, so one, one thing on the battery cages, you know, that I, I'm interested in, in consciousness, one thing I do in, in neuroscience, and, and it was one of the major international conferences, um, you know, the neuroscience of consciousness, had an entire session devoted to robot consciousness, and if... So, there's, so that's not a new thing. That's not, no. okay, can we have conscious robots? The entire session of this international conference was, if we create conscious robots, we've just deferred the problem, then we have to have a full-blown ethics and morality for the conscious robots that we've created. You know, this does not solve our problem, it defers our problem. And that they really taking this really seriously, some of the top philosophers of the mind, thinking about, okay, how, do, how are we going to defend the rights of robots if we succeed in this objective, which I had actually never stopped to think about it, but it was very, it was very interesting that people are actually thinking about it, which is true. If you succeed, well, what have you created? Yeah. Um, you know? Um, we don't need to get to a fully conscious AI to, no, no, no. Uh, either. We, we, we need to, well, we do build morality in, into uh, automatic pilot systems in commercial jets, uh, for example. There, there is, um, I think it's called... In uh, Don't I've crash forgotten. into a mountain. Is that what the? It, 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 yeah, it's intrinsic in their design that they that they will not go into a vertical dive, you know, for example's mm. sake. Um, so, so I don't know if we've answered any of the questions tonight, actually, because they're, they're, every question just presents another ten more questions, really, doesn't it? In this sort of evolving. Um, world of technology and I think probably none of us really have the answers because it's mm. happening all so fast and it's happening faster than we can keep up with. Is that right? Yeah, and it's really hard to do a control experiment of the two-year-old yeah. that doesn't have an iPad choosing Thomas the Tank Engine yeah. over and over yeah. again. You know, yeah. it's, so it's, it's, it's possibly going to be, you know, impossible to really under, 
really know. We're what learning things. as we're going, effectively. Exactly. We are our own test subjects. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Does anyone else want to go and live in Pennsylvania with the Amish? Because that's <laughs> that's what I've thought of. I, I thought about doing that after my daughter's um, cyber security <laughs> uh, information evening the other night. I thought, this is all just too hard. I'm just going to pack it in and move to Pennsylvania. Um, but look, thank you so much for all of your questions tonight. and, and um, it's such a broad topic and I, and I hope that we've answered some of them um, tonight and have given you more things to think about and to go away with and, and to do some more research on and to talk about on Facebook with your friends when you go home and you're meant to be going to bed at 10 o'clock tonight. Um, could I just ask you all to thank Olivia Carter and Michael Arnold tonight. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.